Good morning, Facebook. On Go Erie Live this morning, we are discussing the mystery of Oak Island. Stay with us. Thanks for joining this week's Go Erie Live discussion. Today, Erie Times News online reporter Sarah Grabsky will be talking with James McQuiston about the History Channel's Curse of Oak Island television series. I am Christopher Millette, and I will be moderating your Go Erie Live comments today. Thanks to Go Gannon University for sponsoring these live discussions every week. Enjoy the conversation. Thanks, Chris. So this morning, like he said, we are here with Jim McQuiston. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jim. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I love talking about Oak Island. So, um, As Chris said, make sure to submit your comments or your questions, and we will try to get them to them as we, um, as well as we can um, in the 30-minute conversation. Jim, you've got quite the story to tell, so we're going to get right into it. Um, I'm sorry if I did not introduce him properly. He is a local historian, researcher, author. He knows the ins and outs of Oak Island like no one else. <laughs> um, so first of all, let's talk about how did you get involved in this? What sparked your interest in Oak Island? Well, I actually read the original uh, Reader's Digest article about it, and which has inspired almost everybody that's up there. And uh, I would follow it through the years, but I was also working on my own family history and I had known for several years that I was related to the premier knight baronet of Nova Scotia but I didn't really know what that meant so I happened to be watching uh, the Curse of Oak Island TV show one night and it struck me that premier knight baronet of Nova Scotia Oak Island is in Nova Scotia maybe that has something to do with it so I look for an email address and I uh, sent off an email about it. Have you folks ever looked into this? They uh, had a gentleman, uh, one of their historians call me and we talked for an hour. He asked a number of questions. So I started doing research and learning a lot myself. And over the next few months, I sent them hundreds of emails. And so they suggested in my first book, uh, Oak Island Missing Lakes, they said all of this is going to get lost in the ether because it's just an email. Right. So basically I copied all my emails <laughs> off and then formed it into a book and added to it. And then they had me come up and talk about that. And that, uh, that's when I met everybody. That was in 2017. That's when I met everybody and I actually had boots and eyes on the ground on Oak Island. And it's just gone from there I caught what they call islanditis and I still have it today and uh, so um, that's how the whole thing got kicked off so let's talk about okay kind of stemming from that let's talk about your involvement since how has it rolled you know how has it developed I guess well they had me in the war room in 2017 in fact I was the last person to uh, present in the old war room they moved everything to the new one right afterwards. They didn't use any of that film footage, but they asked uh, additional questions. And my first book was general, uh, addressing legends and whether somebody could sail to Nova Scotia from the British Isles pre-Columbus, things like that, and what might be there. But with these questions they asked, it got me narrowing this down, and so it continued for the next year of me sending hundreds of emails again and I narrowed it down for my second book to the people that I thought did it and the year in fact right down to the month and so again they said you know you're getting such good information and you're tightening it all up here you need to write another book so that one was Oak Island 1632 because that's the year I believe uh, that the money pit was dug and what I found out after I d discovered that was that one of the owners of Oak Island in the past, one of the searchers, he had actually written FDR, who was a big fan of Oak Island. In fact, he worked there for a couple of years and told him he said it could have been uh, built as early as 1635, which was only three years off my date over centuries, you know, so that, yeah. that was a nice confirmation. <laughs> so um, they filmed me then and that was what was uh, what appeared on April 9th of this year um, but in the meantime of course more questions were asked and I was doing more research and uh, something came up with uh, this medallion here that uh, this was discovered uh, about 20 miles from Oak Island but it's tied in with the whole story but nobody knew what it was 
Uh, they just, in fact, there was only one Polaroid photo of it. So I started uh, beating in on that, and mm -hmm. I found out who owned it originally, who I think they gave it to, and how I think it got to this location, and identified what it was. And so this was the first time the, the gentleman that found it found it in the 70s. And he was afraid to show it to anybody because he didn't want the government to take it away from him. <laughs> so unfortunately, this didn't get on camera, but we actually talked him into uh, coming to the war room uh, on his own terms. And he showed it in public the first time to Doug Kroll and Rick Ogina and I. Hmm. And the, the, Rick said, Jim, you run the meeting. So I said to him, okay, you show us the medallion, tell us how you found it. I'll tell you who I think it belonged to and how I think it got there. And that's how the meeting went. So this photo that's on the front of my book right there, that's the best photo ever taken of it. And that was taken in the war room that day. Uh, the gentleman's a very cautious person, uh, shy and cautious, so I don't mention his name at all. But so um, that actually added a whole new aspect to the Oak Island story, which it's in this book. So because um, so much had been found while I was there, and I, uh, information about this, that was coupled with the fact that um, I'm email friends with the Grand Master, or the Grand Historian of the Grand Lodges of Freemasonry in Nova Scotia, and he had suggested I look up a couple of Freemason books, old ones, and I was looking for them when I found this totally different book, and it had the story about a treasure that was stolen this was before the Freemasons were ever formed. There were Masonic lodges, so they were stonemasons. Mm -hmm. But um, it had the story of this treasure that was stolen. So I wrote the Society of Antiquaries that I'm a member of or a fellow with. They didn't have any information on what happened to it. They sent me to the, to the Scottish National Museums. They didn't have any information. They sent me to the Scottish National Archives, and they didn't have any information except that they had the Privy Council minutes where the gentleman that stole it was got off literally scot-free. He was a Scot <coughs> Scotsman, and he got off literally scot-free. And uh, so uh, I thought, well, he he immediately became partners with this gentleman that was given Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. So I thought, well, and that gentleman was in charge of the Privy Council. So I thought, well, the fix had to be in because these men that grouped together were all high-level people in Scotland. He stills it, he gets indicted, he gets off scot-free, becomes a partner with this other gentleman. And so uh, I developed this theory that that was the actual treasure and that it was meant to finance Nova Scotia. And I found many uh, uh, instances where the man that was given Nova Scotia was requesting money and complaining about not being able to get money. Mm -hmm. So this, this was the, probably the most massive treasure that any individual had amassed up to that point in mm -hmm. in Scottish history, and nobody knows what happened to it. Huh. A few of the items found in the money pit that have been brought up with the drills have matched what was on the treasure list. Then, uh, what added to it was the fact that two sons of this man that received Nova Scotia and the person that stole the treasure became the world's first three Freemasons. And I actually found the actual handwritten records from July 3rd, 1634. Wow. And so I started looking into what was happening there it, it, around that time. And uh, it just developed into a complete story of what happened. So I sent them that information. And I knew the third book, they didn't recommend the third book, but I knew it had to be written because it was the one that was going to tell the complete story. Right. And. Uh, so they had me come up and talk to him about it. Um, I don't have any knowledge of whether I'll ever be on the show again or anything like that, but they definitely are interested in my theory. And so um, I get it's somewhat of a one-way street. If they want some information looked up, then they'll write me I about see. it, and they'll give me a little bit of information, and that's how I learn a little bit. I gotcha. But... but um, uh, it's mostly me sending them the emails right. and periodically somebody will send back one and say oh well we're really interested in that can you look into that particular aspect of it so that's how it's developed and 
you know, now it's not uncommon for Rick Lagina, who's pretty much the star of the show, to call me uh, to talk about, you know, either some aspect of it or about coming up against something like that. And he and Doug Kroll are my main contacts. And uh, literally, the poor guys, because I've probably sent them 500 emails, <laughs> and these emails are long, but they're right. but they're actual data. That's the one thing about my books is I I dig in documents where they dig in the dirt, uh -huh. and I have uh, documents to verify every major point I'm making. That's amazing. You know, I might do some logical conjecture to connect the two dots, yes. but the dots themselves, I, I in the books I put what book they're in, and uh, you know, but sometimes how I found that right. book. So I've ended up finding all kinds of things that. Uh, some of it actually contradicts some local legend that they had or, or, or okay. whatever, but I have the proof. The legend is just a legend with no proof. My proof is an actual document, like a land charter. The Privy Council meetings of the king, uh, things like that that are legit. How did this all get started? And like backing up a little bit, explain to us really what is the legend, the mystery of Oak Isle, and how did that like rumor, or how did it all originate? Well, um, the story goes, and, and I think it's not quite this, but it, the story goes that three young men uh, were exploring the island and found a pit that was about 13 inch uh, diameter that was depressed by about a foot. So they there was a lot of talk about pirate treasures, and they actually thought it was Captain Kidd's treasure, and they started digging. Well, they ended up digging 30 foot deep on their own and without telling anybody. Well, at, after 30 foot, by that big, they just got tired of it. So they then started telling people, so a, a conglomerate was put together. This was in uh, 1804. Now, what kind of equipment, heavy equipment they would have had then, who knows, but they brought in a team to dig. They dug down another, uh, down to 90 foot. Well, every 10 foot there was a platform made of oak. And there were some items like coconut fiber, which doesn't grow, coconuts don't grow there, but it was like the bubble wrap huh. of the old days. And uh, <laughs> clay, different items. And so um, they, they got the idea, well, something's going on here. So the story again is that at 90 foot, they found a uh, stone that had some strange inscriptions on it. And that was on a Friday, so they, no, Saturday. And so they took the stone home, took Sunday off, and on Monday they came back and the pit was flooded. Oh, wow. So through the years, they developed this theory that maybe there were flood tunnels that were somehow triggered to flood it. Huh. And I'm, the jury's out for me on the flood tunnels only because you can find trained geologists. One will say there's that's uh, natural fissures um, down below 90 foot. Others will say no, there could, there's no way that it could flood like this based on those. So it's that comes down to who do you believe. Yeah. But the pit itself is really documented as far as them the side walls were hard where they were digging had already been dug out and you know people say well is there any treasure left there well it may have some of it may have been gotten or taken out in the 1800s but when they found it obviously something was still there because who would if you went and recovered your treasure why would you bother to put a oak pit or oak platforms every 10 feet on your way out right. you would just leave a hole and get on your ship and leave right so um uh it, it, then people just started digging and the, it, the early 1800s there's not as much information as people would like to know but the information that i have uh is that the person that owned what they call the nolan cross lots it's a cross made out of these giant rocks he was of the same family as the man who stole the treasure. And he knew uh, the family history because their symbol back in Scotland was the stag, and he uh, had a ship built, which he named the stag. So there's, uh, there's many more connections beyond that. But what are the coincidences that somebody from the same family who came from the same place in Scotland would be interested in being on Oak Island 
uh, where I already connected this other person to Oak Island separate. So uh, I have so many connections like that and connections with the Freemasons and, uh, and is there any idea where the treasure may have gone or any evidence that it's surfaced anywhere or anything like that? Uh, no, not specifically, but uh, the McGinnis uh, sisters, their grandfather or great-grandfather was one of the three men that found it. They claimed that they found three chests worth of treasure. Uh, Fred Nolan, who used to own a good chunk of the island, uh, and he's the one that discovered these Nolan Cross rocks, um, he felt that he had found 11 other places on the island where something had been substantial had been dug out of the ground and drug down to the shoreline. Um, one of my theories, and this is just totally peripheral, and this isn't my main theory at all, but uh, the people that, this gentleman that owned the Nolan Cross Lost back in the early 1800s, they were, him and his father and uncles were all Freemasons, and they uh, started the Bank of Nova Scotia, which became Scotia Bank. And so this treasure was originally meant to finance Nova Scotia. And so, and he owned the lots during that period from when they first started seriously digging until they started recording a lot. So one wild theory that isn't part of my main theory is that they actually found it. They found their ancestors' treasure and they uh, started uh, basically started Scotia Bank. Yeah. I don't have any evidence on that yet, and that's going to be way down the line uh, exploring that. But uh, I don't think these three gentlemen that found it, they always say three boys, but there's some evidence that at least two of them were grown huh. men. Um, one of them actually bought the Money Pit lot right after they, right after they discovered it. Uh, a gentleman owned it that was timbering, getting timber off it. And he went and bought it right away because they were so sure something was there. And um, I think they were treasure hunters, yeah. and I don't think they were the first ones. I think that this, the story of this treasure, it, it was buried in haste, and because Nova Scotia was taken over by the French, and the Scots were chased out, and then the uh, Cromwellian uh, movement in Scotland, Ireland, and England, where Oliver Cromwell took over, he was lopping the heads off all of royalty, and these people were connected very close to royalty. I think they just couldn't go back and get it because they wouldn't want to be in the middle of digging it up when either French troops or Cromwell troops came in and took it all from them. But I think some of them went back there to protect it. And uh, so um, I think that is the reason why, because everybody says, well, why didn't they come back and get it? Well, I don't think they could. And then this family, it was the Alexander family, it just fell apart totally for a number of reasons. And they were the ones that launched Freemasonry. And I have it all in my book, explains it. But they only had influence there for a short time. And then this other family took over, and that family, the fifth, the world's fifth Freemason, has the same last name as the current Grandmaster, huh. uh, his, his mother's maiden name. And uh, several of these men have been Grandmasters of the um, Freemasons. So I think that the information was embedded in a few families uh -huh. and in and most of those families were in the beginnings of Freemasonry other families knew a little bit about it so I think a lot of people have been going into that area they didn't know specifically it was Oak Island or whatever but they were going into that area hunting including this gentleman that did the found that the lost that yeah uh, not found it lost, lost it, it yeah. yes and uh because he was a treasure hunter. That's what he did for a living. Wow. And uh, so I think that it, it had been looked for fairly steadily, uh, and they zeroed in on Oak Island, and then this gentleman who was related to the man who stole it uh, bought those lots uh, trying to find it, and then whether he found it or not, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's an intricate story, but it's like very it's like swashbuckling stolen treasure. Yes. Uh, yes, there is a certain uh, fascination with yeah, it. Yeah, and, and one of the things I surmised right off the bat, and this isn't letting too much of the cat out of the bag, but uh, I surmised that a ship had wrecked near Oak Island because they were continually finding ship parts there, and it's way back in the bay. 
So my second book, which I don't have a copy here, you may have a digital copy of it, but it actually has a sunken ship on it. Well, when I was in the war room with Rick this year, uh, again, I don't know if I'm going to be on the show, but he said we have data points from two different sources that if they're pointing to what we think they are, you're going to be back up here again this year. And when they ended the show last year, they were showing them doing that seismic drilling, which is done with little dynamite charges, on the swamp, and it showed some kind of structure. So a lot of people think that down in the swamp is a sunken ship. And so I don't know if that's what they're talking about, if that's the ship they're talking about, because again, it's pretty much a one-way street. Right. Let's really quickly let's go i know that there's so much information here we could literally talk about this for three hours but let's talk about your history channel appearance before okay. we get delve back into your theory um first of all you were filming for three years you said i've been filmed about 10 hours over three years but they shoot a lot of film they don't use uh and uh for instance we went up to new ross the foundation where this was found and there were uh six people being filmed plus a crew of probably 10 12 people and the black flies were so bad that every even though they sprayed us all everybody was swatting <laughs> their hands so much that i thought how are they ever going to use any footage yeah. and they never did so uh it's way harder than people think it is but it's very serious and a lot of people say well it's scripted i guarantee it's not scripted in all the time I've been there, they never once told me what to say. What to say? One time they told me what not to say because I got over enthusiastic when I walked in a war room and saw everybody and his brother in there, and I said, "Wow, you brought the whole family!" And they said, "Oh, don't say that. You know, <laughs> just walk into the room again." But other than that, they've never ever told suggested you. said anything. It, Prometheus has the right to edit whatever they want, um, and. The Oak Island team is seriously looking for treasure, and they're doing so much that never gets on, on air. Uh, like that uh, Laird Niven, he's their archaeologist. You see him once in a while at a site where they think they need an archaeologist, but he's got an office there and works, I guess, full time. Yeah. Uh, putting in data, you know, checking one thing against the other, and there's a big team. There's on the show. There's maybe eight principal people, but behind the scenes there's at least another eight mm -hmm. somebody's uh coordinating all the uh heavy equipment coming onto the island somebody's coordinating all the paperwork for every theorist renting cars getting hotel rooms all that and then uh the prometheus team is of equal size probably 15 to 20 people and they have a they get everybody up there like eight in the morning and ha get in a circle and have a production meeting and say okay rick and gary want to go down to this lot so you you and you you go down with them you know, and they they parse Send everybody people, out, yeah. and then they just go and film and film and film and hope that they have the, you know, something to put together yes. to make a nice story. So, but what was it like? We were talking about this before the interview. What was it like being filmed? Well, um, I never was nervous about it because I wasn't there for the cameras. I was there. I was a little bit nervous, of course, about meeting Rick and yes. everybody for the first time. But we actually got to meet uh, outside the room just beforehand and uh but it, i saw them setting up and they had these mammoth uh, units over their heads that they filmed with but it literally was like they were wearing camouflage <laughs> once they started talking i don't even remember the cameras the only time i really remember much is outdoors because they were using drones outdoors right uh, they had people on the ground too but they but the you know the buzzing drone up there so you can't miss that but uh <laughs> It was funny because the first year they gave me a truck. They said, go across the island and go around a curve. We're going to film you coming in. Because obviously they have to coordinate your arrival. Right. You know, the rest of it's uh, free flowing. But, and they said, there, there's a walkie talkie in there and you'll hear them call you. So <laughs> I'm sitting there waiting. I'm already smiling from ear to ear just because this is going to happen. Yes. And then uh, they say, Action James. And I just burst out laughing because I never thought I'd hear that in my life. You know? So then I drove across the island. I could see the drones filming and everything. And then they had told me where to park. And Rick came out and said hello and all that. And uh, so uh, I was never nervous about the filming at all because I was so, I'm so into my theory. Mm -hmm. I've been into Scottish history for a few decades. But I was uh, just so into this 
because everybody loves a mystery and yes. this one's been going on they've been actually digging now i think for 224 years That's insane. and i believe that they knew about it before that i believe it was buried in 1632 and as soon as anybody could go looking for it they did and uh, they just didn't find it till 1795 they found the hole uh, there's like three areas the swamp the money pit itself and the cove that's just about 500 feet off to the side, three to 500 feet walk down. The reason why the cove and the swamp are of interest is because they found a lot of parts from ships there. So they okay. think something's gone on there. And they dug up a, an old wharf last year. But what also helped confirm my theory was that I had come to the date of 1632 for historical reasons, but I did a comparison, a bar chart of some of the early carbon dating and the window where all of the of the larger windows of each piece of carbon dating crossed over was 1620 to 1650 and my story essentially takes place in that time period uh, so i'm like well there's confirmation right there mm -hmm. uh, scientific confirmation so the bulk of it is i'd say about 80 percent of his actual documents about uh, another 10% is just logical conclusions, and another 10% is actually science. Depth chart readings, uh, weather records, carbon dating uh, records, uh, etymology of words. Uh, um, where did this word for this person or this area come from? Mm -hmm. uh, but I love the documents. I've gotten uh, two different uh, original, not the original, but copies of the original for land grants from 1625. I, one I had to get, it was in Latin, so I had to get it translated, <laughs> pay a translator in Scotland to translate it. But the other one is held by a university not far from Oak Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, that's pretty wild yes. to be able to go back to the 1600s that is and insane. read a book. And a lot of these books are scanned in, luckily, by uh, universities uh, to preserve them. Yes. So it might be the only copy of that book in the world, but it's it'll give you a PDF of the originals, mm -hmm. it'll give you a, a text. I always download the text and then I can do a search. If I'm looking for my guys, I just do a search for that name and you know every art or every page that has that on there and that's you know how I put all this together. But it's been such so much fun and it's like putting together a a puzzle where I'm making the pieces fit in a way, but they're fitting pretty comfortably. And it's uncanny that I get so much help that I don't even expect at all. Uh, either somebody uh, sending me a uh, an email, look for this book, or could you help me find this out? And then it all blends into the story. So it's... Are you surprised by the popularity of the show and and speak about, you know, what, you know, obviously it's a great story, but, you know, how, you know, are you surprised by how this, this show has taken off? Uh, yes, in one way. It's the number one, I understand that it's usually the number one show on cable TV, which is a big wow. uh, <laughs> uh, range of shows uh, during its season. And then they show reruns. Yeah. Uh, they get roughly three and a half million people view it so uh, but it is you know one of the uh, remaining mysteries that I think two things about it some more current mystery even though it's a couple hundred years old we're not talking about what happened to the pyramids right we're talking about what humans that are probably related to some of us did right. on an island uh, the other thing about it and I ran this by Rick one day but I, I was on the phone with him I said you know the thing I always loved about it is it's just like if I got some of my buddies I said, hey, throw the chainsaw and the shovel in your pickup and see if Billy will get his back hole and we're going to go up there and figure this thing out. <laughs> and he said, that's exactly what it is for us. <laughs> exactly. That's is what we wanted to do. And they, they hunted there uh, for uh, four or five years before the History Channel oh, approached wow. them for the show. But when they inherited a Swiss cheese island because it had been bulldozed right. and dynamited and everything and a lot of the records were lost so their first years there were boots on the ground just trying to get the layout of the island it's mm -hmm. 140 acres and um, meeting different people that could give them info and also going through past documents to compare this document to that document and they were only just recently narrowing down to what they, where they think the original money pit was because they had dug what they call searcher shafts on the sides to try to come in to to uh, foil the water traps was the idea of those 
And the curse of Oak Island, I have to reveal the secret, it's bogus. <laughs> it, there is a curse because equipment fails all the time and <laughs> a lot of things go wrong. But the way they say is seven must die. And that's because that how it came about was four people did die in 65. And then a journalist went there to talk to uh, some of the people that knew him and she was or he was talking to one of the girlfriends of one of the men that died and she just made an offhanded comment is it going to take seven people to die before they'll quit looking for treasure on that cursed island well he went with that as the curse of oak island seven I must see. die but there's actually evidence that nine have died and what they mean by died is actively searching like being in the ground or digging or whatever and there's evidence that actually nine people have already died. Three wow. underground, one fell into a pit, four went down, started down a pit and got overwhelmed by a gas, another one a boiler blew up. So, but there's, but there isn't any question that there is sort of a curse. I, I, I like to say that Murphy of Murphy's Law just lives right around the corner <laughs> and that's why all this stuff happens. All right, Jim. Well, actually, we are out of time. I feel like we didn't get to even half of the material I wanted to talk to you about. So, um, that being said, pick up one of... He's got three books. Three books full of information. Yes. Um, for And it's all on Oak Island, the research you've done, your theory, um, just great information. And, of course, um, make sure you watch the episode. Uh, Jim's it aired originally April 9th, but like you said, reruns all the time. Right. So, and I think Hulu, I don't know if that season's on Hulu yes. or not, but uh, of, of the three books, this one is the one that tells That's your first the, one. No, this is the third one. The third and this one. <laughs> tells the most complete theory. Okay. And like I say, there's a slim chance there will be a fourth one because I'm getting so much confirmation it's coming out of the woodwork. Well, thank you so much for being with us. And well, thank you. It was yes, fun. Absolutely. Thanks to everyone who joined in and participated in this week's Gory Live discussion. The video will be available for replay on the Gory Facebook page and on the Gory homepage. Thanks again to Gannon University for sponsoring the discussion and to James Quiston for joining us today. Uh, you can find upcoming topics and guests on the Gory Facebook page each week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>